All right, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to another keynote session of the Digital Container Summit. Um, my name is Lexa. I'm the marketing manager here at Container Exchange. And uh, now for this session, we're going to dive into the dynamics of freight procurement in COVID times. Uh, our speaker for this session is Patrick Berglund, the CEO and co-founder of Zanetta, um, which is a price comparison platform for containerized freight. Uh, who aims to transform the shipping and logistics industry uh, with data analytics. Berglund himself is a logistics and tech enthusiast uh, who possesses a true passion to modernize business processes related to logistics and procurement in the supply chain. So without further ado, Patrick. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate that really nice introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Um, Pleasure being here and, and thanks uh, again, Alexa, for, for the kind intro and, and also the invite to participate today. Uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit about the dy dynamics of freight procurement in COVID times as the heading here suggests. Um, now, in order to sort of put, put uh, the right context uh, in place and, and paint sort of the correct background drop for this, I, I want to quickly, for those who's not aware of what Zenetta is all about, I want to quickly give you the short introduction to that. So with Zenetta, we built up the world's largest real-time database of um, uh, contracted ocean freight rates. You can see here today our database consists of more than 200 million rates, <clears throat> and we get about 9 million, uh, more than 9 million actually, new rates into that platform on a, every, uh, on a monthly basis. We use this data to populate market intelligence on, on more than 160,000 port peers around the world. Uh, and we work with all the key sort of stakeholders in the industry. You can see here, bottom of the pictures, the shippers, the forwarders and carriers. But the main source of data comes from, from uh, the shippers and the forwarding side, where the shippers themselves represent more than $10 billion worth of ocean freight procurement uh, on an annual basis. Uh, they come from more than six industries and they all use and leverage the data uh, around the procurement uh, of, of uh, container freight. And uh, just to give you a quick sort of snippet of these, what type of businesses we're talking about, here's a small representation of some of the customers. You can see, again, they come from all kinds of industries and usually they're uh, very uh, big volume players. Now, we also work with seven of the top 10 global freight forwarding business and more and more on the carrier side as well. Next to that, we have consultancy businesses, technology businesses, and financial institutions also leveraging the data as it gives a very accurate uh, and uh, precise picture of the market movement. Um, what we actually do with this ecosystem of, of, of companies is that we collect freight rates. And this sounds uh, like a very mundane uh, task. Uh, it's a huge challenge to crunch thousands of thousands of these Excel spreadsheets because about 95% plus of all the data we come uh, get comes in these, this format, which then comes with all the uh, requirements in terms of how you normalize and process that data in order to uh, aggregate it into market data. And that's what I'm gonna lean on, that market data as we review the market. But before I do that, I want to sort of take a step back and uh, look at the market conditions that we're currently facing. And in order to do that, we've got to take a step back and think about what we came into this year with. Uh, think about 2019 end of it, where the big talking point was IMO 2020. And it had been for a couple of years and, and, and the expected billion dollar cost increase that carriers, plan to pass on to their customers was the key thing that we went into 2020 with. In fact, in, in, in Q4 19, the rates of uh, on, on Asia Europe started to soar and uh, shippers and BCO settled new long-term rates at, at a somewhat higher level. I'll show you this in the data afterwards, but seemingly they you know, accepted the cost in the, uh, the, that the increase that the industry were talking about. But uh, notably, Trans-Pacific didn't respond similarly at all. And this raised huge questions as, uh, as to why there would be any difference at all between these two uh, biggest trades, right? And this is something we've claimed for years that rates don't correlate with the cost base of the carriers. Uh, 
And in particular, fuel in this example gives a very clear example that the balance between supply and demand is the thing that dictates the carrier's ability to adjust their rates. And IMO 2020 is now in full effect. Oil prices collapsed this year, but rates have soared. So you have a complete opposite movement. And this sort of establishes the fact that supply and demand is the driver of rates. Um, and then as 2020 arrived with the pandemic, we've seen shippers and BCO scrambling for equipment and, and space and, and carriers blank sailings right, left and center. Now, volumes have been missing from shippers or, or MQLs are getting exceeded from some and none of the parties have been delivering according to the agreement and the market has been in complete flux this year. Uh, in fact, we, 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 we again get to see one of the key reasons for why it's so hard to create a long-term trustworthy partnership between carriers and their customers as the shipper BCO side you know, report about six months of, of complete firefighting and chaos as well as you know, arrogant behavior coming from the carrier side. A, a constant battle to get your good ship is what they report and a, and a push from the carrier side to get their customers from a long-term contract rate market over to a higher yielding shorter market and this this has caused massive frustration among shippers bcos where only a few have escaped and and mainly those from what we can see that you know have essential balancing cargo that the carriers need and <clears throat> what i think is sort of notable a notable here is that we, as we enter the pandemic we we were all worried that the carriers would fight for market shares and and try to grab whatever volume was around and and that rates would plummet very similarly to what we've seen in the past and maybe in particular um, in the beginning of 2016 where when hunting went belly up about halfway into the year uh, and we we because of rates uh, tumbling so so heavily now in fact, I must admit that maybe surprised, but even more so very impressed. The carriers have really seized the moment and have completely shifted the market to an almost historically strong seller's market. And that's where we find ourselves today. Um, and the big question for a lot of shippers uh, is how they should handle this. What's the cost increase they now face by going to market now under these conditions trying to settle their new long-term rates for 2021 is there more of a buyer's market uh, ahead coming uh, up in in 2021 and will you know big volume shippers then strike back at the carriers and, and try to penalize them for for the behavior we've seen so far in this year and sort of continuing the vicious cycle of distrust between these players there's, there's simply so much uncertainty. What do we really have in store? Just think about how much that can change based on the results of the US election, right? It seems to come with, with completely different outcomes where one is willing to further push the agenda of protectionism and the, the other one wanting to open and reverse the deals that has already been changed, you know, whether it's the deal with Iran or a trade agreement with China. And, and and this is this is the reality of container shipping these days that all of these things that I mentioned matters and, and this is what everybody now is questioning and evaluating and before we review the data I wanna I wanna put some more sort of uh, underlying important capacity data on the east west trade so trying to focus here on the biggest trades and um, so that we understand what's sort of a little bit more behind when we uh, look at the the actual price movements because this year has been an extreme sort of capacity u-turn where from almost uh, in the beginning of the year we could see almost one third of the capacity compared to last year uh, taken out of the market uh, uh, to begin with to where we find ourselves today, where we sort of close in on a two digit percentage increase year over year comparison. And that's where we find ourselves now. And this, this, um, uh, this East West sort of trades is actually on track to increase capacity year over year with upwards to, to towards 20% unless we start seeing golden week uh, contractions in the next weeks, right? Uh, and I question, 
whether the demand boom is driven by a sort of like a counterintuitive consumer behavior because unemployment rates are still soaring and you know we might not yet have seen the worst from this as governments still supply air pa aid packages uh, which might hold consumption artificially high um, we also have this shift from you know people spending less on travel and, and services to physical products with uh, also people moving out of the cities into new homes in the suburbs or countryside and all of these things are increasing the amount of goods that needs to be shipped um, and that's effectively what enables the carriers to both ramp up capacity as i mentioned so heavily and subsequently also jack up the prices and out of that we expect the carriers to report even bigger and better profits over the next few quarters and man what what a, what a seller's market we now find ourselves in in and and with that sort of like context of where we came from and what we have today um, i wanted to look at some of the data and i want to start here by uh, looking at China main to North European main ports and I'm gonna see I'm gonna take it a little bit slowly since some people might not have seen this yet but uh, you will always see on the top left the origin and the destination this is a clustering of the ports because we know they're correlating price um, and then what you will see here uh, bottom left you will see the orange representing the uh, line representing the short-term market and the blue one representing the long-term market then connecting this to what i said uh, previously i want to outline the first sort of uptake on prices here this is q4 2019 that i just uh, marked out here what's interesting to note here is that you can see that this was the massive uptake and anticipation of IMO 2020. And then you can see the new long-term contracts that got settled at that time. They were made at a higher uh, uh, higher level than the one in Q4. Uh, you will also notice here that there's a delay between what happens in the short-term market and what happens in the long-term market. You can clearly see that from the uh, downward fall again where it takes a bit of a while before the longer uh, term markets follow suit. That pattern you can see uh, historically as well. Now, all the data we're gonna look at is um, based on 40 foot standard dry boxes. And I've selected a timeline that goes back to the beginning of 2018 to give you some historical perspective on how the market has uh, developed. And what we find particularly interesting now is the latest, uh, latest uptake on the short-term market. And you can already now see that, you know, relative to the uh, three years outline here almost, you can see that it's it's getting at a very high level. And if this holds up, if the short-term market holds up with it, which is what currently looks, um, it, it, the, the outlook, outlook looks like, one would expect that the long-term market again follow suit and increases right so this leaves a few questions right because a you can see here clearly what i mentioned about you know carriers having an incentive to push their long-term uh, shippers bcos into the shorter market because of the higher yield and uh, the the profits they can make there but then you raise a few questions about whether this is a good time to market for the shippers the BCOs and uh, arguably this could be the year where they should consider alternatives to their normal 12 month cycle and operate with maybe a six month or a quarterly uh, opportunity to negotiate so that if it becomes less of a seller market down the line, they could reap the benefits of a shorter term contract. Mm. This is how it looks like for Asia Europe. I quickly want to look at the back wall on this even though i'm i'm gonna stay focused on uh the the um, uh, front holes i want to quickly look at the back wall here because it's so clear that uh, european exporters also struggle uh, quite heavily it's the same time period and you can see how the market is slowly sort of um uh, let me see if i can draw this up as well uh, no idea how to 
put that back on. Anyways, um, how they've struggled um, over the last couple of years here, all the way back to 2018, how cheap it gradually became. And then going into 2020, again, you can see the slow uptake on IMO 2020, but then how the market has completely exploded as uh, uh, capacity and equipment has been uh, difficult to uh, get your hands on. And you can see also that the blue line uh, overall has, has moved up a bit, meaning that not only have the shorter market uh, imposed substantial cost increases, but the longer term market is also uh, slightly up. Again, the, the delta here is so big relative to hi hi historical numbers. So there's also a continuous risk of being rolled short shipped for the uh, B shippers BCO on this uh, trade. And um, we anticipate further uptakes on the long-term contracts as uh, 2021 pricing starts to come in as well over the next few months. This is also um, this is also quite rare because historically, I just want to outline, I historically it's been very favorable and cheap to be a Euro, uh, European exporter, uh, especially going to Asia. And you can see here, rates level below 600 US dollars for both the short and long in the, in the mid, mid of 2019, where now we talk about rate levels between, let's say 800 and 1500 US dollars uh, with uh, less volume being moved on the, the blue line. Back to the front holes, and <clears throat> this is uh, the Trans-Pacific one, and I think this one is incredibly interesting these days. I'm uh, going to give it one more stab to see if I can put annotation back on. Um, nope, uh, I'll live without it. I, I want us to uh, focus on the first sort of uh, peak to the left of this chart, which is... Um, 2018 going into 2019 you can see all the way to the left uh, when the orange uh, line uh, the yellow line bottomed out and started to increase that's where you had the chi a trade war with china being announced and you had U uh, u.s importers front loading cargo creating an artificial capacity squeeze and rates that soared and, and raised to above two and a half thousand US dollars uh, on the short term market closing in on 2019. And here you can see very clearly, late, a, bit, a little bit later, the blue line follows and these big volume players had rates between sitting at maybe 1,250 US dollars closing quickly and at, at, at closer to 2,000 on the peak there before it came a little bit down. And then it's been, you know, fluctuating uh, between 1250 and uh, closer to 2000 some of the peaks but what's really interesting now is the latest uptake this is where you will see what i talked about in in the introduction that increased sort of like uh, uh, demand that we've seen and the reduced capacity that, that we had and now you know the the short-term market is exploding to historically high levels you can see it's closing in on three and a half thousand us dollars uh for a 40 footer going from uh chinese main ports into us west coast and this is interesting now that you see again the the reason why the the the, the blue players the long-term big volume players are now sort of like forced onto the short-term market because the the yield is substantially higher for the carriers to charge them more north of three thousand dollars relative to on average for long 1500 us dollars now <clears throat> the more volume and as i said the more volume they put on this uh, this uh, yellow line here the more the more profits they'll post um over the next quarters but the interesting really interesting picture here is that how is how long they maintain that and whether any of the carriers will be more opportunistic and see if they can win market shares or if Merck and MSC will take the lead and try to win so back some of the reported uh, lost market shares and maybe they lower the rates as well and how that will be played out because they still need to be careful about the balance between supply and demand but um, shippers uh, will definitely be looking for uh, a cost increase in their next uh, long-term contracts here based on what we see from this data. I'm gonna wrap it up, wanna slowly look at a somewhat different corridor 
this is the transatlantic going from European main ports into US East Coast main ports. Uh, this is actually very different. As you see here, it peaked in the middle of 2019 for both short and long, long, a little bit delayed more towards 2020. But this is a beautiful example again of how it has not correlated with any cost increases for IMO at all. And in fact, as we went into 2020, the, 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 there's only a slow downward trend on this corridor. Um, and um yeah i think i think this is slightly different but this this corridor uh, in the beginning of uh, corona uh, actually saw some increases in in volumes being moved on this trade but still uh, not enough to squeeze capacity and as for the other trades we looked at uh, not a, not a trade that has sort of had that uh, uh, hefty price increase um and i think that leaves me to, to also want to cover a little bit of air freight information because I, I believe that sums it up a bit on, on Ocean. I see that we have some question coming in here, uh, which I'm going to address. I, I want to cover up a little bit on what we've seen on air freight. And I want to approach air freight from a similar sort of tactic as we, as we did with, with Ocean, just sort of trying to summarize what we've seen so far this year. and. I think the key thing with, with air is that the pandemic hit air freight really hard. Like overnight capacity disappeared from the market, uh, especially with all that belly capacity on, on passenger aircraft coming out of, uh, of, of the market, coming to a complete halt. And up sort of towards March and onwards, it only got worse and worse before we saw the market sort of calming down somewhat around summertime. Now, key sort of things that happen here is of course that long-term rates um that shippers big volume shippers operated on could you know be uh, be it at 1.5 or two dollars per kilo it, you know overnight these prices were irrelevant and they had to move into a spot market with with rates five to ten times higher overnight and we get the same reports from our shipper community that it's been a constant firefighting uh, mode so far this year and they've been moving from, from long term to weekly or per shipment spot rates. And, and airlines is really fending to survive and, and converting passenger across even to load cargo. And the push from the shipper side that we see now is as they try to get more predictability back, they push towards a monthly, maybe a two month or a three month rate uh, validity. Uh, and there's definitely appetite in the market for longer. Uh, and we can get from both the supply and the buy side that there, there's willingness to sort of go back to that, uh, but it's hard to get it in today's market. Utilization is in general very high on the front holes, uh, but not as much on the back holes, which means that there's an opportunity for those operating on the back holes to move into a longer term uh, rate agreement somewhat earlier than what we've seen on the front pole. This is what we anticipate and see from the, from the air freight uh, market. All rates are obviously still you know, subject to, to COVID premiums. And the key thing we see from the shipper side is that they're not rigged to be in the spot market. There's very, very little appetite for them to, to continue going on with this. That is a very costly and inefficient for them. And all parties seem to be, you know, anticipate that we will see long-term rates coming back as the market stabilizes again. Uh, it remains, though, to be seen what the timeline for this is. And it's a huge, big unknown. Um, yeah, I think that's a quick sort of like 2020 summary of, um, of air and ocean. Um, wanted to save a few minutes towards the end to see if there's any questions. Um, let, me, let me just read through them. Uh, do you think that the volatility with procuring freight during COVID will lead to permanent changes in the procurement me methods? That's a great question. Um, and one we've actually heavily debated both internally and with, with customers. Hi, Alex, is it a question? Yes, yes, mm. go for it. Listen, we, we see, I would say that one of the main things that we see is that 
there's there's a huge desire to sort of get a little bit back to normal, which means you know let's do it as we used to do. But one of the absolute most interesting thing I personally find is that it also seems to be a more more of an appetite to consider like an index link contract or something like that. Right. The problem that I that we debate internally on this is that lack of trust between the parties that historically mm-hmm. been so bad, which you know definitely haven't gotten hasn't gotten better uh, to go through this pandemic. Unfortunately, I, it makes me a little bit sad on behalf of the industry, but but um, I believe I believe that businesses might acknowledge the huge risk they're exposed to with a fixed flat twelve month agreement. But uh, and and that some might be keen on moving to a six month or a quarterly one, but they're simply not operationally equipped to live with the short validity time periods that are now. So to go to your question, there might be more, uh, there might be a higher frequency frequency of RFQs, right? Not that does not mean a spot market transition, and I also believe that there might be appetite or i know there's appetite i'm worried whether it's possible there's appetite for like three-year agreements five-year agreements if you can peg it to the right data sets that allows you to fluctuate accordingly to the market because what really happens if you're too far off the market as as currently we see on some of the corridors you can get rolled uh, and and you can be forced over to the the short-term market if you're uh, above or below your mql so that's some of the stuff that we can uh, see changing Mm. yeah there's there's some more here should i move to that alexa yeah yeah i can uh, i can read it off for you i guess we want a comparison um with the 2009 crisis um, so, our, compared to the financial crisis in 2009, are the dynamics then changing more or less during the worldwide pandemic? There's different, we have different sort day? of uh, angles to, to come at this question. Um, yeah. if, if, um, if we're talking about the dy- dynamics of, of what's like the everlasting change, then I would say like in 2009, there was this um, systemic sort of issue uh, that we all knew and understood uh, were the reason for sort of the, the slowdown in the world economy. Now, I believe we have a different situation. Now we have, as I mentioned, we have a, a, a president in the, the biggest economy in the world that are far more protectionistic and we have a pandemic that seems to sort of move around a bit, causing supply chain disruption and uncertainty and, and this constant sort of operational focus to get the goods moving. Um, I believe that relative to 2009, we have a market that is far more in flux. There's far more uncertainty because in 2009, we kind of on, only waited for things to uh, recover now we're still looking like six months in we're still looking ahead into the future with so much uncertainty with mm-hmm. with unknowns we've never faced before and i believe i believe that's the the biggest difference i see uh, mm-hmm. at least yeah um, so a comparison between uh, like an unprecedented global outbreak of a virus uh, causing chaos and then a systemic uh, economic recession yeah Okay, and I think we've got another um, question um, as well. Um, What is the major, um, I'm assuming, problem uh, going on because of COVID? COVID? Uh, How much time can it, I think this is a continuation, how much time can it take all these matters to go back to normal? Or is there any chance? Ah, great question, great question. I mean, it depends a little bit on what you define as normal as well, right? But, but, but now we're so short-sighted. Everything is like tomorrow. Nobody sort of, all right, nobody's not true, but the vast majority of people is not focused on medium to long-term and, and plan for that and optimize for that. There was like a period in 20, let's say 2019, if you look away from IMO 2020, there was a much sort of bigger uh, discussion topic going around about how we can modernize and optimize freight procurement. 
six uh, for six months of this t- uh, year sh- nobody cared jack shit the only thing that matters is to get good shit it's it's uh, people don't have time i talked to some of our customers and they're so swamped these are people that are responsible for let's say anything from 10 million dollars to 300 million dollars of, of ocean freight procurement and they're all reporting the same they're so bogged down in operational focus and, and hiccups and supply chain problems and um and uh I believe that that's that's probably where I'm most concerned about the industry. It's almost like this year has caused, uh, I don't know, maybe one, one and a half year delay of processes that should have been iterated on and improved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Well, um, that concludes our time. The next session uh, is starting. Um, so thank you so much, Patrick, for the insight um, and the great presentation. And uh, enjoy the rest of the summit. Thanks for having me, Alexa. I look forward to the rest of the presentations. Thanks. Great. Bye-bye. Bye.